My name is Dorian Chung. I'm Deputy Director, Curatorial and Chief Curator at M Plus Hong Kong. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined here by uh, Nalini Malani, artist who's based in Mumbai and uh, celebrated for her practice that encompasses many mediums and spans more than five decades. At M Plus, we're privileged to have a number of important works by Nalini in the collection, including the installation titled Remembering Mad Mag which you began in 2007. So without much further ado, I think we will just go right ahead and watch a little clip of the installation of Remembering Mad Mac when it was shown as part of the artist retrospective at the Centre Pompidou in Paris in 2017. When the living can no longer fight, the dead will. With every heartbeat of the revolution, flesh grows back on their bones, blood in their veins, life in their death. The rebellion of the dead will be the war of the landscapes, our weapons, the forests, the mountains, the oceans, the deserts of the world. I will be forest, mountain, ocean, desert. I, that is Africa. I, that is Asia. So Nalini, this uh, work brings up two aspects of your practice in general that have been important for many decades as I understand it. Um, one aspect is the inspiration and also frequent citing of female mythological and historical figures in your work. And then the second aspect is the topic of memory. Um, so we're here showing the, uh, an, in the image of um, the figure of Mad Meg that you referred to in the work that we were just watching. Um, and here famously depicted by Peter Burgle the Elder in his 1562 painting. Um, so the figure of Mad Meg has been interpreted as representing for you the last remaining hope, the female aspect that tries to solve the ongoing war that consumes human civilization. So in your own words, Nalini, could you tell us about um, what Mad Mag represents and means for you? Um, the painting is very important for me and has been since I was a student at the art school. And what uh, over the years struck me was that the figure of Mad Meg uh, also fell in line with my own obsession with uh, characters from mythology, which have even today a relevance. Um, but Mad Meg and that particular image of Bruegel, the painting of Bruegel, shows her walking through a landscape uh, with accoutrements of, from the kitchen. There's a pan and there's, you know, an upside down pan on her head. Uh, you know, and she's going with an army of little creatures. Um, it's almost like trying to cleanse the land of uh, extreme um, uh, uh, hardship and violence. Uh, and this uh, resonates also with the other uh, mythical characters. Uh, and I think I could make a broad landscape of the characters with uh, Cassandra and Medea and from the Indian mythology, Sita. So that's been the broad-based uh, interest that I've had um, in trying to find ways and means to bring forth um, 
uh, these figures from history, from allegorical paintings like this one, and also myths. Uh, the obsession with the female voice and the female point of view to me is of utmost importance because I think that too much around us, too much of the civilization so far around us has been man-made and uh, even boundaries are man-made between nations. And I think a new way of looking at things needs to be done from the feminist and the feministic ideology. And that doesn't mean only women can do it. There are a lot of men who also think from the, from the feminine point of view. And I think that this is something that I really would, um, I mean, I'm obsessed with it. And so I find many ways to key in these ideas, whether it's on a drawing or a series of books that I paint. And now with the shadow play uh, as something that I've developed over the years, mm -hmm. uh, which began actually as Buddhist prayer wheels, because we had had extreme violence, sectarian violence, in the city after the destruction of the Babri mosque uh, mm -hmm. in Ayodhya, a uh, 16th century mosque. And uh, mayhem uh, broke loose in, in the city of Bombay at that time. And I just, we needed to calm things. And uh, it was most essential then to find a form which would have that effect. And the Buddhist prayer wheels for mm -hmm. me was, was very much that. And from then on, I have been developing the series of uh, video shadow plays, uh, and then on and on as it goes. Now, for example, Remembering Mad Meg started uh, in 2007, and it was with only two projections and lights uh, with eight cylinders, as you see it here at the Centre Pompidou. And it has developed from then on into what it became at the Centre Pompidou with four projections. And the music also, the, 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 the sound design also changed. So I do have that, that from time to time I uh, change uh, or uh, find other reasons, uh, uh, sometimes from texts outside after I've made the work, I find, for example, uh, uh, only Bergson's work uh, doing a lot for me in terms of what is time, psychological time, psychic time. And uh, also uh, uh, links with uh, uh, a, a woman philosopher from France, Luce Irigare. It reminds people in the West of Plato's cave. Taking a cue from Luce Irigare, she speaks about uh, the cave as the womb uh, mm. and uh, hysteria, you know, the, it is the female voice. And it is the birth of the shadows that come because when the baby is in the womb, what does it see? It probably just sees fleeting shadows. So there's a very positive aspect to the cave as the something from which the world came about. It go on in my head and what I read. And I get a lot out of, uh, um, like the, the, the painting of Bruegel, I also get a lot out of reading philosophies of the period and also how it has come into our generation, mm. where uh, what is that resonance? For me, what is key is what is happening now and how can we address that for the sake of the future? Thank you, Nalini. There are a few things that I think we can unpack there. Um, so, so looking at the actual physical format that you studied um, uh, referring to, um, obviously, the viewers can see in this installation views um, and also in the video that there are these rotating transparent drums that you have done reverse painting on. Um, but then they are in movement and then there are also projections on top of it as well. So I think in the video especially, uh, viewers can really get the feeling that you are immersed in this space, um, maybe even feel uh, overwhelmed by their senses being bombarded or assaulted with images and sounds. So that experience of being immersed, being overwhelmed, was that intentional? And does that symbolize something? Is that, does it symbolize the state of the world that, that you were just talking about? You know, uh, when I make a, a work of this nature, I also have uh, a part of me which is the seer, the viewer. Uh, apart from myself, I have to see what, well, how will this impact or what was the experience that 
an outsider would feel. What am I making? And am I, what I'm making, is it, um, is it doing something outside as an object? So one of the things that uh, emerged from uh, these uh, researches on how I should uh, go ahead, and it was over a span of time, was that uh, the uh, uh, immersive quality and the engulfing quality was of utmost importance. And therefore the sound as well is of utmost importance in the, as well as the text. It also, uh, for a moment, it may have a certain amount of, uh, how shall I say, a, a shock value, let's say, but it also has a fascinating, I've watched people sit in these installations for hours on end. So there's a kind of mesmerizing quality and people take away many things from it. Uh, so that's the part which I find, you know, uh, uh, it's the memory also, you know, the memory of it and people recall and they've even spoken about it later to me that this is what I saw and this is what was happening and there were no two things separately and why was there a crippled girl with uh, with crutches and, you know, and there was an explosion and maybe it was a landmine, you know, so there, be, there be, people start to read into the to the drawings and the, and the kind of uh, superimpositions that start to happen uh, with, this, with the, the slow movement. The theatricality of it, the uh, engulfing of it, it's mm. like, in, in one sense, in, to put it in a historical context, um, mm. in Asian theaters in India as well, you, you often have repeats. There is, there, it's always a loop, and every mm. loop is a new iteration. Mm. And that's what we have noticed even in Asian theaters. Uh, and so, you know, coming from that part of the world, mm -hmm. this was another aspect which for me was uh, important to uh, work through. Now, the thing about remembering is that uh, I think that it's very important always to have the past there. The past is there as a husk in which you put in things that you are going through now. And somehow those resonances of the past do come mm -hmm. in that uh, in that uh, in that husk. Um, so you were using the term shadow play, um, and it's really the term that you invented for this body of work. Um, this uh, multi-channel uh, videos, as well as the reverse painted cylinders that create a whole immersive environment, is a video slash shadow play, which perhaps is a bit of a paradox because video is either a projected image or image that is shown on a monitor while shadow play is the negative of an object or image. So could you speak about um, how you reconcile this paradox? Is this intentional? Perhaps how uh, this term speaks uh, to uh, the aspect of memory that you were referring to? After you are, one makes uh, the work, there are, uh, one learns from one's own work as well. And one of the things I learned was that shadows have a series of opacities from mm. being very slightly translucent to being absolutely opaque, depending, and I can orchestrate that or choreograph that through how much paint I put on the cylinders. Mm. So that part of it is somehow on my keyboard, you know, I can choreograph that. And that is the interesting part because sometimes it's just a, a, a wistful kind of shadow. It's like a, a, like a wistful memory, let's say. And then there's the huge opaque shadow which almost obliterates light. So in some senses at that moment, light which we see as so strong uh, can be blinding and then, but a shadow can soothe it out. And there's a moment, of, you know, a, a, a soothing, let's say rather than a negative as such. Uh, I mean, after all, remember Peter Pan. He wanted mm. his shadow back. <laughs> I, I, there are just such an evocative words that, that you have used in, in discussing um, the work, um, engulfing, being inside a womb, and being immersed, and yeah. um, healing. Um, so that really makes us feel that we can't wait for um, the opportunity soon to show the work here at MPAS in Hong Kong. So with that, thank you very much, Nalini. Yeah, thank you very much, Dorian. <laughs>